ask you to please rise. We're going to get ready to worship our God because he is good and faithful in our lives. And he's a solid foundation. Amen? Amen. All right.
can I say it as well When my voice can barely speak How can I sing you a song In the midst of suffering Jesus, will you meet me here Let your peace wash over me I need you now more than ever Teach my soul to sing My God is still in control And still He reigns on His throne Though mountains may tremble and sea billows roar I'll sing it as well with my soul God is still in control And you have not left me alone Though the world has let me down In all of my sorrow and pain I will trade it for speaking a bit about rest and how God is always waiting on the other side. I went through a devotional with my cousin about a month ago, um, 
and just wrote out some notes and some things that I thought were important or just things that God put on my heart. Um, so the devotional I went through talked about the story in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27, when Jesus was sleeping in the boat and the disciples were scared because there was a big storm happening. But Jesus was resting. Um, he was resting because he knew it was coming. He knew God and he knew that everything was gonna be okay. Um, he wasn't worried and he even called the disciples out for having little faith and um, for not trusting God and not trusting that he would bring them through this storm. He then got out of the boat and told um, the storm to be still. And in that moment, it was as simple and as immediate as that. The scriptures tell us, tells us that there was a great calm. But sometimes God lets you hit rock bottom so that you can discover that he is the rock at the bottom. Sometimes God allows you to get into a situation only he can fix so that you will see him fix it. As a result, you grow in your faith as you experience and appreciate his power. Rest is a gift we too easily tend to push aside, but life without rest is unsustainable. Um, rest refreshes our bodies, giving us the energy we need to honor God and to love others. Learning to practice rest um, is a spiritual discipline that helps us to enjoy God's presence and realign our priorities. Make rest your friend. Rest is not always easy, but it is important. God is always ready, waiting for you to receive what he has for you. When you take a second to rest and be in God's presence, there is so much he's waiting to do for you, waiting to show you, and waiting to bring into your life. We often use activity to numb ourselves of our need for intimacy with God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. But we must be intentional to establish healthy boundaries around the different parts of our lives. There is so much power in rest. So allow Jesus to be the center of your life in this season and in all the good and bad seasons to come. And through it all, make sure to take time to rest. Rest in God's presence. Rest knowing that he is working all things for good and simply rest in the fact that God is good and he knows us and loves us always.
Church, how's everyone today? Excellent. Well, yes, a little clap for wonderful worship. Well, my name is Vienna, and I am in grade 12, and I was given this beautiful opportunity to actually just share with you a little word of encouragement that I just felt like the Lord really wanted to share. So when I was kind of praying and thinking about what um, I should share and what I wanted to say, God actually brought me back to something I wrote in the summer during a small group. As Corona happened, I was in a small group online and there's a moment when a song, a worship song played and we just reflected and listened to what the Lord spoke to us. And this is what I felt the Lord speak to me. And I want to share with you what he said this morning. And I want you to think of it as God is saying this to you as his son and his daughters. The moment I created humanity, I hungered for an intimacy. An intimacy that I would know you and you would know me. I want your heart to be at the same rhythm as mine. I want to walk in sync with you. I want to listen to your broken words and I want to make them new. Since when have you had to prove yourself to me? Have I not longed for an intimacy and vulnerability? All I want is you the version that my hands formed from pure dust. I don't want your man-modified perfection. I want you as raw as you can be. You have a safe place to fall apart. You have a safe place to release expectations that you have of yourself down. You have a safe place to worship in the midst of brokenness. 
remove the veil of protection, perfection, and shame. As a groom removes a veil from his bride, allow me to lift this veil that you have put on yourself. I want your pureness. I want your heart. I want your pain. I want you as you are. I'm removing this facade so that I can make you new. I won't take your brokenness and just put it back together because I will make you completely new. But for me to make you new, you need to show me the brokenness. I will wait at the door and I will knock. My scars, my pain, and my sacrifice is so that you can know me as I desire to know you. Open up the heart that I long for. Open up to me because I want it all. Allow me to fix your heart. Allow my love to fix your heart. Allow my peace to fix your heart. Allow all of my perfection shine through your brokenness. I am your healer and restorer. I am your father. I am your rescuer. Let me rescue you. And if you came here this morning and you are feeling completely broken, nothing is going right in your life, or maybe you came in feeling great and just the overwhelming presence of God, I want you to know all God wants is you to be here. He wants all that you are. He doesn't want you to come through these doors and pretend that everything's okay and you raise your hands during worship and you put on this facade, this, this look that everything's okay. God's saying, I don't want that. I don't want this fake version of you. I want the real, raw, vulnerable person that I made from pure dust. You are valued and you are loved and you don't have to perform for God because he knows everything about you. There's nothing you can hide from him. So allow him to just fill you this morning and remind you of your value and remind you that you can come here like home. It is home for you. And you can be as raw and vulnerable with God because that's all he wants. He just wants your heart. So I pray that that just sits with you this morning. God bless. Thank you so much, Vienna. Very much appreciate that. How many of you are thankful that we serve a God who doesn't require us to be somebody before we come to him? It's such a beautiful thing. You can go ahead and take a seat. I'm just so excited this morning that we get to worship together, that we get to grow closer to Jesus together. Um, these are exciting times. Exciting, exciting times. So welcome, whether you're in person today or online. My name is Pastor Sam, and this here is one of my great friends, Rita. Hello, guys. I'm one of the youth here, and I'm so excited to spend this morning with you in person and online. Hello. Um, we have a couple of announcements today. Um, Oh yeah. yeah, if you guys are new or you just like have any questions or prayer requests, we really want to hear you and know. So please go and fill that out online at lifecenter.org. Um, oh wait, no, it's connect.lifecenter.org. Sorry, and Absolutely. we'd love to help you. And yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, so if you wish to give as well, um, you can do so online, again, lifecenter.org, um, or in person at our secure drop boxes at our locations. Um, a few announcements to send your way. Um, this Friday, we had a great conversation with our students uh, simply around the topic of racism and eth ethnic discrimination. Um, and it's a very important conversation that may be a little bit uncomfortable to engage, but is much needed in this season. And so we're gonna continue on that with our young adults. Um, and so if you're a young adult and you're listening to this, you're watching this online, um, next Sunday, December 6th at 6 p.m., we are going to dive into this topic. We're gonna open up a discussion. We're gonna uh, approach it from a biblical perspective. We're gonna have some teaching, discussion panel, all of that. It's all gonna be through Zoom. Um, so what you need to do, if you're a young adult and you wanna be a part of this, uh, go ahead, hop online on the website, find the young adults group, um, and you register for that. And an email will be sent to you with the Zoom link uh, where you can connect. So that is very, very exciting. All right, guys, so first, second, and third year college students, we are having a third term of Bible school, and we're going to be covering a couple topics, so if you guys want to register or just, like, learn more about that, go to um, 
it's, oh, no, never mind, sorry. Go to <laughs> mycenter.org slash training, and it starts on December 8th, and yeah. I love it. Now, that's very exciting, but I'm also very, very excited for Christmas. Christmas. So we've got our Christmas gear because we're excited. I know I'm Woo. excited. I know Rita's excited. It's going to be great. And here at Life Center, um, we are kicking off our Christmas season next Sunday. Well, actually today with uh, Christmas Spectacular boxes. So you can feel free to pick those up at your campus. But next Sunday, we are going to start a new series. So can you get a drum roll, please? We're starting our God With Us series next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. It's our Christmas series here at Life Center. It's so, so exciting. Now, if you're wondering what you should do for Christmas Eve, I've got a great solution for you. You should come join us in person for our Christmas Eve services. Um, they're going to be great. They're happening at all our locations. So look online for times. Um, you can register at lifecenter.org. Registration is going live today. Um, so I would encourage you to... Uh, Go ahead and register this week to make sure that you can uh, be a part of it. It's going to be awesome. So what else is also happening this Christmas, Rita? Guys, I'm so excited. If you guys have been going here for a while and you guys are a part of the youth, you know what I'm about to talk about. It is the Christmas Spectacular. Come on. Guys, come on. Let's go. Yes. Okay, I'm super excited for this. Oh, my goodness. It's like my favorite time of the year here. Oh, my gosh. But um, basically, it's for junior high and high school students. It's on December 11th at 7 p.m. Bring a friend. Uh, dress fancy. Bring a mask. You know, live it up with the peeps on Christmas. Or not Christmas, December 11th, actually. But, you know, it's still pretty exciting. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> um, to register, go to lifecenter.org slash 613 Christmas. And I really hope to see most of you there. And, yeah. yeah. Or all of you. But, like, you guys, you know, eight groups. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So we at Youth love to make silly and ridiculous commercials, um, basically for anything we can think of. And we just want to share one of them with you this morning to invite you to our Christmas special. You can turn your eyes to the screen. It's rolling, it's boot. Oh, hello everyone, my name is Pierrette Poivron, du papillon, le pipe de pu, pom pom. All of my friends, they've been telling me about the beautiful event coming in the winter. The winter. The winter. Ah ah, oui. The winter, December 11th, the second week of December 11th. That is when a big event is going to un unravel itself before our very eyes. The Christmas special. That is what we're inviting you to. It is our pleasure to invite you, to extend this invitation, to tell you you are invited to the Christmas special. Bring your good spirits and get ready for some absolutely amazing, probably the best ever time you could ever see in the world this Christmas, December 11th, 2020, come prepared for the best time ever! <laughs> well, I don't know how to follow that, so I'm just going to start. That's the only way to follow that, so that's good. Um, Actually, today, before we, today actually starts the whole Advent season leading up to Christmas. So we're going to start our Christmas season next week. Uh, but today we want to look at something really, really powerful that all of us do and all of us experience, and it's judgment. Every single one of us judge people, and we experience judgment. And so today we want to look at how we shouldn't judge others and where we should be judging others. And when we get this right, it's heaven on earth. And when we get it wrong, it's hell on earth, and we all can experience it. Dr. Glenn Packiam says this, Everybody wants to speak truth to power, but fewer want power in the person of Jesus to speak truth to us. And my prayer is that today that we would allow God's word to form and to shape us when it comes to talking about who can judge you, and more importantly, how can you be, how can you be judged, or how should we be judging, and how shouldn't we be judging one another. 
Before we do that, let me just talk a little bit about nuance. How many in your life, by a show of hands, those of you online, you can just hands up in the little chat, the little hands up emoji, whatever one you want to use. Um, but how many of you here have ever found in your life that you have been offended? Can I see your hands, please? Anybody been online and read the words? People say, like, I'm outraged or I'm offended. You can see it. Well, here's what's true about offense for me and for you. Just because someone's offended doesn't necessarily mean something wrong has happened. Just because someone says, I'm offended, doesn't necessarily mean something wrong has happened. In fact, whether you are or are not offended has no bearing on truth or false. In my life, I have been offended because someone has said something untrue about me. I have also experienced or been like, ah, offended because someone said something that was true about me that I didn't want to look at myself. And so again, oftentimes when we hear the word, I'm offended, we have to understand the context in which it's being expressed. There's nuance to it, and the failure to see nuance, oftentimes we can just say, then all offense is bad. But the truth is absolutely no. Not all offense is bad. There's actually being offended has no bearing on whether something is true or false. And so you and I live in a time where I would recommend, or I would maybe not recommend, but I would express that we are living in a time where judgment is higher in a place that it shouldn't be. I don't know if it's higher than in any time history, but I do think social media and our digital connectivity, I do think it's changed the game. So I think we're being judged in ways that are higher than maybe any other culture before. You know, if you just say the wrong thing in the wrong way online, I'm not talking about saying something deplorable, I'm just saying express something the wrong way online, you will experience judgment. In fact, whatever you say online, you will experience judgment. And even when you talk one-on-one -on -one now in our workplaces, wherever it happens, we go. We often need nine. If we have 10 minutes to speak, we need to have nine minutes to say what we're not trying to say, 30 seconds to say what we're trying to say, and then 30 seconds to reinforce what we didn't mean when we said what we said. That's just the world in which you and I live in. And so again, we have judgment higher where it shouldn't be. And here's the other problem, though. We actually have a proper type of judgment dangerously low where it is necessary, where it is imperative. And so, you can't judge me is often attributed to Jesus. Jesus said, in fact, if you have people in your life who don't know Jesus, this is something that they know Jesus said. And what they often will say over and over and over again, didn't Jesus say, you can't judge me? Didn't Jesus say this? Well, we're going to look today, did Jesus actually say that? And the answer is, Sort of. Here's what he said. Judge not that you not be judged. So judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You actor. You're just playing a part. You're being hypocritical. First, go first, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so Jesus says, judge not. So did Jesus say, did Jesus actually say it? He says the words. No, no, don't judge. But then he says, that you not be judged. So later in the same Bible, the apostle Paul says this. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? He is saying here, what, 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 why are you as the church judging people who don't follow Christ? Those are two different standards, two different kings, two different kingdoms. So what business do you have judging people who don't know Jesus to live by an ethic that you as a follower of Christ are living by? What, what business do you have to do that? For what have I to do with judging outsiders? But then Paul says this, is not those inside the church with whom you are to judge? So Jesus says, judge not, and then the Apostle Paul comes along later in the same Bible and says, no, no, okay, don't, don't judge outsiders, but aren't you called to judge people who you're in community with? Aren't we called to do that? So again, Jesus says one thing, and now the Apostle Paul comes along and seemingly says something different. So the answer is, well, which one is right? And like offense, it depends on how you understand the word judge. Because again, all of us judge in sinful ways, 
And all of us need to be judged in righteous ways. Every single one of us. Let me read a story to bring this into a little bit clearer focus. And Jesus, as Jesus went, the people pressed around him. So Jesus is in the midst of a crowd and everyone's pressing around him, bumping up against him, reaching out, grabbing hold of him, trying to just, you know, he's in a crowd and people are really pressing around him. But it says that there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, which if you understand the Old Testament, you really understand that she was ceremonially unclean. This does not mean that she was a sinner. It simply means that she was unclean. And so she couldn't, she couldn't get close or she should not have been in this community setting. Okay, not because she was a sinner, but because she was unclean. And though she had spent her, all of her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. And she came up behind him and she touched the fringe of his garment, which is a massive no-no. And immediately her discharge, her physical condition uh, of blood ceased. And Jesus said out loud, here's what he said. Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are surrounding you and pressing in on you. In other words, Jesus, who hasn't touched you? Everyone is pressing in on you. But Jesus said, no, no, no. Someone touched me, for I have perceived. Here's what Jesus said. For I have discerned. The same word right here. I have made a judgment. I have perceived. I have discerned. And there, I'm making a judgment that, yes, I know everyone's touching me, but somebody touched me with faith. Somebody touched me differently than the whole, all the crowd touching in on me here. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling. Once again, she was unclean. She shouldn't have been in the crowd, let alone touching a rabbi. And falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So Jesus perceived. Jesus discerned. In this moment, Jesus made a judgment call. That power had gone out from him. That someone's life had been touched. That not only had he been touched, but that his, the power of God has flown from him and someone's life has been touched by God in this way. And he did not only want to heal her physically. Once again, as I said a couple of times, she was unclean. So she was always pressed out of community, always pressed out of community. And what does Jesus do in the midst of it? He doesn't just touch her physical need. He says to her daughter, you're part of the family. And he brings her in socially as well. Because when Jesus heals, he doesn't just heal one thing. He's healing the whole thing. And Jesus moves powerfully in this moment. So you and I need to understand that when we read the word judgment in Scripture, or we talk about judging one another, it really means one of two things. The word judge, we're called to judge one another or we shouldn't judge one another, really means to perceive or to discern like Jesus is doing in this instant. He is perceiving, he is discerning, he's making a judgment call. A uh, trick question, not, like, sorry, not a trick question, honest question. If you know it, you're a Bible scholar. How many disciples did Jesus call to walk with him for the three and a half years? How many? What was the number? Twelve. Twelve, right. Not twenty. So that means he made a judgment call of what 12. He didn't just come and say like anybody. No, 12 meant not 20. In fact, if you read the Gospels, you will see that some people actually come to him and they say, hey, can I follow you and be one of the initial 12? Can I do that? And Jesus says, no, you need to go back home. You've experienced a touch of transformation, but you need to go back home and testify what, what, you know, what God has done or go show yourself to the priest or do this or do that. But he made these judgment calls that, no, no, these are the 12, the initial 12 that are going to grow and become billions later on. But this is where I'm going to start with. But he made a judgment call as Jesus looking at these individuals. And if you know anything about their lives, oftentimes you're like, man, are you sure you picked the right 12? But he makes a judgment call. 12, not 20. This is a judgment call. He's perceiving, he's discerning. He is speaking into things, he is seeing things. And if you read how Jesus engages with the 12, he doesn't always say positive things to them. In fact, there's times where he says, are you offended too? He doesn't change what he says, but there's things that he weighs in. There's things that he engages with. He is constantly holding to them to account. He's constantly loving them, yes, but calling them higher, leading them, giving them tasks, correcting them, engaging. He is constantly judging them. 
but not in a way to condemn them, in a way to help them grow, in a way to help them do what he said, which is I'm going to help you be not fishers of fish, but fishers of men. I'm going to follow me, teach me, learn of me, but you can't just have positive affirmation. You can't just have encouragement. You also need correction. You need to be held to account. I need to call you on some things if you're to grow up. And in this space, Jesus judges them. And it's the type of judgment that you and I need. But see, the word judgment also means to condemn, which Jesus could have done under the law to this woman who came and touched the hem of his garment. But he doesn't. He doesn't condemn her at all. In fact, he heals her once again physically and societally, and he brings her close. Let's do it this way. I want you to imagine that you're driving home and you're a good baker and you're going to make a beautiful banana cream pie. And so you go to the grocery store because there's one thing you're lacking, one ingredient you're lacking for this extraordinary pie that you want to make is you're lacking bananas. And you go into the grocery store, you have to make a judgment call that you need bananas, not apples. And hopefully you're intelligent enough to figure out the difference between them. Now here's where it gets even more tricky because I'm not a grocery store aficionado. I don't enjoy grocery stores. Some of you love them. God bless you. I just don't. Here's where I go wrong in grocery stores where I don't have enough smarts. I always get nailed because I buy the bananas that when you go to check them through, you have a, a bunch of bananas and you check them through and they say, that'll be $86. And I'm always like, what? Well, I always go to the wrong organic section. You know what the ones like where they're $85, but the bananas are about this big. So then I always have to go, oh, sorry. I, I, I actually wanted like the regular size, but the, the ones that are the bad ones, like the ones, but they're cheap. Like I want the bunch that I can ring through and they're like, those are a buck 85. And I'm like, those are my bananas. Right? Those are the ones I'm making in the pie, right? So again, you have to discern, you have to discern bananas are different from apples. And then even a grocery store now, organic versus, I guess, bad bananas. I don't know. But you got to discern those things. Here's where my palms begin to sweat. When Lori sends, like, so that, like, I can figure out bananas from apples. But I can't figure out when Lori sends me to the grocery store and says, could you get a pack of chili, like, powder? Could you send me a picture of precisely what it looks like? Have you ever got sent in to get salad dressing? I tell you, I'm coming home with the wrong one. Because you look down the aisle and you're like, just get like, just get, uh, you know, get Italian. Uh, there's like 57 varieties of it. And I just know invariably I should buy all of them, which is going to get me in trouble in a different way. Or whatever one I pick, I just understand I'm going to get it wrong. But you have to make a judgment call. We all have to make judgment calls. So they can get like, you know, big and they can get a little bit more narrow. Jesus and Paul don't contradict. The Bible doesn't contradict itself whatsoever when it uses the word judgment. In the place of discernment. We all have to discern if people are following Jesus, we all have to discern if people are living with integrity, spiritually mature to handle a specific assignment, have earned our trust. Before you disclose to someone, maybe confess or open your heart or share something, you have to make a discernment. You've got to make a judgment call. Are they trustworthy with, that, with what you're about to share? Can they steward it? Can they hold it? Can they keep it in confidence? Are they going to blab it to everybody else as a prayer request? That's the Christian way we gossip. You share something with someone and then they share it with everybody else. Not gossiping, but as a prayer request. That's still gossip. Doesn't matter if you say, hey, let's pray for gossip and finish it with let's pray for. That's still gossip. You and I have to discern. Is this person trustworthy? We have to discern, am I called to ministry? What does it look like? You, you know, if you're, you may have to discern who should I date? Who should I marry? Uh, the job you should take, the job you shouldn't take, what class, if you're going into college or university, what classes I should take or what I shouldn't do, should I take a gap year? All of these things require you to make a judgment call. And here's what's hard about judgment calls. You are making them based on incomplete information. 
See, if you, if you have 100% of the information, you're not making a judgment call, you're just making a decision. But oftentimes you and I are making judgment calls because at best we have 50 to 60% of the information. Like when Lori chose me as a spouse, at best she had 50% of the information. Because I'm telling you, from the day we met to today, I have changed a lot. Hopefully in some ways for the better. In other ways, who knows? It's not my message, that's Lori's. When I met Lori, I had at best 50% of the information. And the rest of the 50 that I've got is only good. See, I'm not as dumb as I look. <laughs> See, we have to make judgment calls. As a parent, sometimes you've got to make a judgment call. Do I let my kids struggle here or do I step in? Do I let them work out what their faith looks like to them or do I step in? I've got to make a judgment call. Which means that sometimes when we discern, when we perceive, we have to engage with one another, we can get it wrong. Because we don't see the whole thing. We don't have 100% of the information. So now I want you to listen to what Paul says to the church in Corinth and see if it makes better sense. It is the Lord who judges me, Paul says. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. He's now not talking about discernment. He's not talking about perceiving. He is saying, don't pronounce judgment. Don't judge everybody else on the basis of their character and expect them to understand your life based on your circumstances. This person does this, they're a bad person. You do the same thing, well, I want them to understand it's the circumstances of my life that made that happen, not that I'm a bad person. We judge one another based on where we think people are on a character level, and we want people to judge us based on our own experiences or on circumstances. And the Apostle Paul is saying, don't do that. Don't pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. Because then he says this, the Lord is going to bring to light everything that is hidden in darkness, and he will disclose the purposes of the heart then each one will receive his commendation from God. In other words, you don't know all things. So we need to let one another into our hearts, let each other into our lives to bring account, to speak, speak truth, to discern. We need people judging us in this way. In fact, if you have nobody speaking truth to you, you are in a dangerous place right now. If the only way that you live your life is by your own wisdom, your own intellect, your own heart, your own, oh, me, 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 your world is too small. You need some other people who you trust who can speak into these things, into your heart and into your life. It's, it's not always nice, but it's sometimes it's necessary. I want you to imagine yourself, you're cut, you're bleeding, and you're lying in an alley. This is the type of judgment that we are often left with, which is wrong. This is pain. This is you have been victimized. This is someone has done something to you that they shouldn't have done. Now I want you to think about the same scenario. You are cut, you are bleeding, but you are not lying in an alley. You are lying on a skillful surgeon's table. This is the type of cut often we want in our lives because though we are bleeding and though we are in pain, it is to make us healthy and better and whole. You see, it's not just the presence of pain that's the problem. It's also the nuance and the context that you and I must engage with. Does that make sense? So this is what the scripture says in Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul says, in other words, don't pronounce judgment. Paul is saying, don't walk around condemning everybody else. Don't walk around saying, thank God I am not like so-and-so. Thank God that I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Thank God that I am more holy than so-and-so. Stop doing that. Don't do that. Stop walking around thinking that you're all that and a bag of potato chips. Stop doing that. Stop walking around in self-righteous ways. Paul is saying that to the entire church, not just one part of it. Stop doing that. Because to condemn or to sit in a place of judgment is to sit in a place of superiority over another. And here's what is true. This type of judgment, this type of judgment now that I'm talking about, which is not discerning, not perceiving, not holding to account, this type of judgment, when we condemn one another, when we sit in places of superiority over one another, here's what it brings. It always brings one thing. It brings hell on earth. Because when we do this, we are not partnering with the Holy Spirit. We are partnering with the enemy. 
Because here's what the enemy does. The enemy takes the one thing that you have in your life as a struggle, and he accuses you and condemns you of that one thing again and again and again without mercy and without relenting at all. He's the accuser, the scripture says, of the brethren, of the sisters. He accuses us. And he tempts you and I consistently to judge one another in the very same fashion. And it is why you can see it, whether it is individual or if a group of people believe they're superior than another, which our Canadian history is replenished. It's, it's full of examples of this. It only brings hell on earth, not heaven. And so the scriptures are aligned. This is the type of judgment that is sin. But the scriptures are also clear in this, that this is the type of judgment that I or you oftentimes can self-justify. Let me give you an example. Like you, like some of you perhaps, you know, we at Life Center have these things called expense reports. And what it means is that at the end of a month, for those of you who don't know this, at the end of a month, anything that you expended within a obviously within a budgeted amount, but anything that you put on an expense report or you purchased on behalf of the church needs to be put on a sheet, a report, and of course, every receipt has to be there. It has to be listed to the dollar, to the penny, so that everything reconciles, that this is what I bought for the church, here's all the receipts, so that there can be integrity, financial integrity in what we're doing. I've been on staff for 25 years, and one time in those 25 years, there was an individual on the staff who will remain nameless, of course, um, whose the, the numbers worked out every month, but the story didn't add up. Because here's what's true. With your expense report, wherever it is that you, you work or where I work, it's the same thing. The numbers can add up, but you could lie about what were, you were doing with that receipt. So this individual was going out and getting coffee for themselves and things for themselves, and they were then just putting on a report that they were meeting with so-and-so or meeting with so-and-so. And when you did a little bit of a quick accounting and checked, hey, did you meet with so-and-so? No, I never met with them. Uh-oh. So the numbers matched up, but we had to get to a level of integrity because how many of you know that the numbers can match, but you could still be lying? And that's still theft. And so these are issues of integrity. So it's not just to the numbers reconcile. It's to get to the heart of it. So when the scriptures talk about that we are ministers of reconciliation, when the scriptures talk about that we are all going to give an account, this, it should send the holy fear of God into our hearts. Because you and I can walk around deluding one another because, hey, the numbers match, the numbers match, the numbers match, but what's really going on in the surface, this is what Jesus says he knows and he's going to bring to light. He is going to give an accounting of these things. So humanity is full of this type of judgment. It's full of condemnation. It is full of betterment in not just the culture, but also the church. But Jesus said this. This is what he said. I read it a moment ago. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. That makes me want to like take the bar, and if the bar's here, go... <laughs> How do we put the bar right here? With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So Jesus said, didn't just say, don't judge one another. He actually says, no, no, don't judge one another because when you do it, you may delude yourself into actually thinking that you're okay. And with the same measure, because you're, you're comparing your holiness to somebody else, not to God. So you feel really good when you compare this way. I've told this story a hundred different times. Like if, if getting into heaven is based on our good works and our behavior, like I want you to imagine that you're in the line. And there's St. Peter at the gates. This is not biblical, by the way. I don't know why we always tell this story. But there he is. He's, and then there's, there's Jesus. And he's, okay, a, a, entrance into heaven. And you look in front of you, and it's like your Uncle Dave, and he's a schmuck. And you're like, oh my gosh, thank God he's before me. I'm going to look like a saint after Uncle Dave. I mean, he go, let him go first. He's been a mess of his life. He's been married 87 times. Like, he, this guy couldn't keep a Oh my gosh, thank God. Then you look behind you, and there's, you, do, you can't see, you, you miss the person. You're like, oh, okay, great. You, 
look behind you again, and then you feel a little tap on your back, and it's this, this little lady taps you on the back and just says, like, do you mind if I get in front of you? And then you look and you realize, oh my gosh, it's Mother Teresa. <laughs> and then she steps in front of you in the line. How many of you know that in, if that was a real scenario, you'd be going, is there anybody else I can try? I don't want them to go after her. <laughs> like my Uncle Dave, I was cool going after him, but like if you put like Mother Teresa in front of me, then like, why should I let you in? I gave 50 bucks one time. Like you're just going to have this self-justifying, but aren't you glad that our entrance into the kingdom is not based on self-justification, but on the work of the cross? It is a complete and it's a final work. And so here's what Jesus says to you and says to me. Stop condemning one another because you don't have the whole story. Stop sitting in a place of judgment thinking you know everything when you don't. According to Jesus, all condemnation comes first from a genuine lack of humility, admitting what we don't know. Using the fruit example we used above, there's a world of difference between bananas are different from apples to bananas are better than apples. Now, talking about fruit, it's pretty silly. But switch that to ethnicities. Switch this to genders. And you see how serious this condemnation, this superiority, this sin infects us. Because when our hearts are filled with pride, we can mistakenly believe that we are better, that we are elite, that we are superior in many ways. And this shows up in how we treat and see and value and listen and learn from others. Or as Jesus would say, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Notice Jesus doesn't ignore the problem here. He doesn't. He prioritizes the issue, though, by bringing it to light as only he can. Let me ask you a question. Has anybody here ever gotten something in their eye, online or here? Anybody got something? Show of hands. You got something in your eye? If you get something in your eye, sometimes it doesn't even matter how small it is. It can be as small as a lash from your own eyelid. But it can get into your eye, and your eye can begin to water to the point where it doesn't matter how small that is in your eye. You have a vision problem. And so what is Jesus saying when he says, judge not, at least you be judged? He is saying that every single one of us, when we do this, when we sit in condemnation over one another, we are doing it with impaired vision, thinking that our vision is perfect. And that is why Jesus says, take the log out of your own eye. Because we always reverse this. We always see other problems as bigger and ours as smaller. Take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to address the speck that's in your brothers. Notice what Jesus does not say. Jesus does not say, take the log out of your own eye because there is no speck in your brother's eye. Jesus is actually saying, this is really hard because the truth is your brother needs to know there's still a speck in their eye. They still can't see properly. There needs to be judgment, discernment, perceiving, accountability, engaging, but don't do it from a place of self-righteous condemnation. Do it from a place of fellow impaired vision, fellow ones who need only what Jesus can do. And so we need to do it in a spirit of humility. Sky Jathani says this, the commandment to judge not is a warning not to exclude anyone from the reach of God's love or to see ourselves as inherently superior to others. We may disagree with our neighbors and we may discern another person or group to be wrong. But when this discernment leads us to value our neighbor less, that is when we move, we, we move from discernment into judgment, condemnation, and ungodly exclusion. This is where Jesus shares how we shift from judgment in discernment to judgment in condemnation. When we do this, we've lost a heart of humility. And when we want it, we recognize this. What's the next step? Jesus said, first, take the log out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly. First, a genuine willingness to go first. Lord, our world needs a fresh move of God. Start with me. Lord, my family needs to change. Start with me. Lord, my workplace needs to change. 
start with me. Start with me doesn't make it all about me. But what it says is, Lord, I want to be a part of a holy remnant. I want to be a part of seeing you do what only you can do. Lord, this area needs healing. Start with me. Going first again isn't making it all about you. It is taking a step to make it all about Jesus moving through you. And that's a beautiful thing. I say this in closing. There's a prayer that I have been praying in my private time. It's if you join the Methodist church, this is the covenant prayer that you pray. And I think it's powerful. It's a prayer that I have been praying again just in my own private time. And for those of you who, as Pastor Rhonda speak, spoke about a few weeks ago, there are some of you who pray. Uh, and you can just freestyle with God. You can get and pray and you just go for it. And you, your heart pours out and it's fantastic. For those of you, you go to pray and you're like, I've got two words, like, thanks God. And then I get stuck and I get, you know what, just pick up the Psalms and begin to read it. Or pick up, pick up a book of common prayers and just begin to read through them. God's not bound by your methods, so don't get hung up on them. Just pray. Just engage it with your whole heart. But this is one that I've been using in my own heart and life. And it goes like this. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or lay aside for you. Exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and your disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. So the truth is, we are drowning as a church and as a culture in condemnation, in elitism, in superiority, in better than isms. We're drowning. It is everywhere on social media. And is it any wonder when judgment from condemn from a spirit of condemnation, from a spirit of accusation is unleashed? Is it any wonder why the world can feel sometimes like hell on earth? And simultaneously, we are dangerously low on biblical accountability. We are dangerously low on a different type of necessary judgment is for people to perceive and to discern and to speak into our hearts and lives things that they're seeing that once again, they may cause offense, but it's the good kind of offense. They may cause pain, but it's the good kind of pain, like a skillful surgeon having something cut out. So may we learn to discern the difference between unhealthy judgment and the judgment that we need to look more like Jesus. Pastor Sam? Amazing. Thank you, Pastor Jason, for that word. Absolutely incredible. Um, thank you all for joining us today, whether in person or online. We're so glad that you were here and that we were able to grow together with Jesus. Um, just a few reminders. Tonight is our annual business meeting at 6 p.m. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can register online on our website, as well as following that will be our uh, all-church prayer meeting which again, you can register for on our website. Um, outside of that, if you signed up for Christmas Spectacular, you can pick up your package right now at any of our locations, and we would love to celebrate with you. Friends, it's been an absolute pleasure if you're joining us online. Have a great, great week, and we will see you next week. 